So last lecture, let me just do in math again what we did last lecture and then see if this helps clear up some confusion. We sort of started to look again at this parametric regression setup that we constructed coming in from exponential families, understanding that uh, there's, there's no stuff of conjugate prior, that is particularly elegant with Gaussians because the necessary computations are just linear algebra, and that we can construct priors on function spaces, actually on parameterized functions by assuming that a function can be written through some kind of mapping with some feature functions, and then assigning a Gaussian distribution to the weights, and then marginalizing over the weights, um, uh, or sort of using the fact that Gaussians are closed under linear maps. So if you have a Gaussian random variable and you apply a linear or affine map to it, that's still a Gaussian random variable. And notice that this gives this kind of distribution over values of the function at input dot or bullet. And the corresponding objects in here are these, where so this sort of is, implies a, a piece of, of computer code that predicts the value of the function at arbitrary collection of points, so in particular also at individual locations, but also at sort of lint spaces or grids or collections of evaluation points for the function, which is always a Gaussian distribution, which has a mean, and that mean is given by a vector that we get by taking the mean vector of the weights and applying from the left this feature map that we get for all the input points on our mesh, and then applying it, that, that gives us a, a matrix, right? And we apply that from the left to the mean vector. And a covariance matrix, so if you have n input points in x, that is an is a n by n matrix, because we have to construct a joint distribution over n locations. And that matrix has this particular form. So it's, we get it by taking the covariance matrix over the weights, sigma, that's of size number of features by number of features, or number of weights by number of weights, let's say f by f. And then we apply from the left and the right this feature matrix, which is of size n by f. So when we do that, this kind of inner product, we get an n by n matrix out. And then we add uh, the observation noise, because that's just part of the linear map. Yes? So the, so the question is, this is a marginal distribution. That's true. So we are marginalizing out the weights. We are doing an integral here. By, um, and you could call this a prior, and this a likelihood, by the way, not posterior, right? Um, so if you marginalize over this, you get a marginal distribution over the function, function values. Now the question is, why should we do it like this? And there's sort of two, I think, questions going around. One is, in which sense is, what kind of object is this? Well, this is a prior itself but it's a prior over the function now because we've marginalized out the weights. So it's a different object. We've mapped it into function space in some sense. And the other question is, why should we choose this particular set of features? Why not something else? And we'll talk about that today. Yes? Okay, so this is a good question. There are these two dots. And um, one, is, one is filled in, that's a bullet, and the other one is a circle that's not filled in. And there's a question about what this notation actually means. And this is actually the reason why I use these symbols, because this is a little bit tricky, and it has to do with broadcasting in sort of array-centric programming. Because on the one hand, you could say, so if you think of, of the dot as an individual number, Right, an individual location, an X, a point in X, then what we can do is we can evaluate this function k for arbitrary pairs of inputs. Right? And by doing that, we construct a covariance between the function value at one input location and the other. And to stress the fact that this function k has two inputs that don't need to be the same, I'm using these two symbols filled in circle and empty circle. 
But if you think of the circle as an array of input locations that our code will natively broadcast over, then sort of the, the circle and the bullet are kind of the same thing, right? They're just two sets, of in, like, two sets of inputs or the same set of inputs, and then we get a covariance over arbitrary function values. So from a function perspective, when we implement this function k, it's a bivariate function that takes in two inputs. And if we think about the distribution of our function values, then the function values will be collections of inputs. They are array-style objects. And then we will always broadcast over this function k and get big matrices that contain evaluations of this bivariate function at various points. And actually, understanding this point is maybe the most tricky bit of, like, aspect of all of this. This is why these functions also have a big name. They're called the kernel. This already sort of stresses that this is very central to this concept. So we saw last week that the one thing we need from this kernel, the one property, the actually sort of the observation is, ah, so really we only need this m and this k object, right? The features can be sort of hidden inside. They can be abstracted away. And the m object, we noticed, it just needs to be a function. We just need to be able to evaluate it wherever we want. That's the only thing that actually matters. So it's pretty flexible. We can put in whatever we like. But for this k object, the kernel, there's a bit of a constraint because we will need to make sure that this is always a valid probability distribution. And you'll remember that mean vectors or Gaussians are just arbitrary vectors. But covariance matrices aren't just any matrices. They are symmetric, positive, definite. Or actually, they are positive, definite. And maybe at some point in the tutorial or so, we can talk about why symmetric doesn't actually matter so much. So positive definite means that, here's the definition again at the bottom of this slide, for arbitrary vectors v, if you take such a matrix A, in particular also this kernel matrix, and apply v from the left and the right, the number that comes out always have to be, well, so for definite, it has to be larger than zero. For semi-definite, it has to be non-negative. So larger or equal to than zero. And actually, we are fine with larger than or equal to zero. And so the question was, how can we make sure that such functions always have this property? How can we construct such functions k such that they always have this property of being positive definite? And that's what I did last Thursday. One way to get to such a construction is what I did last Thursday. I wrote down these bunch of Gaussian features, so little bell-shaped features, square exponential features. And then we observe that if we increase the number of these features more and more and more and more, while also reducing their height sort of proportionally to the number, actually to the square root of the number, then we get a converging sum, a series, so an infinite sum, that actually converges to a finite object, function-valued object. Not a finite number, but a finite function-valued object, k, which we can evaluate at arbitrary points xi and xj, such that matrices constructed from these pairs or broadcast out from such collections are always positive definite. And in some sense, they take, they sort of mask an infinite sum over infinitely many features. The parameters are gone, the weights are gone, and we sort of have an infinitely wide neural network that we're working with. This is also why such models are called non-parametric, because the parameters are infinite. There are no more parameters to actively or explicitly talk about. And I pointed out already last uh, Thursday that actually this construction, which may seem quite ad hoc, is actually sufficient in the sense that any function that is positive definite, so it has this property that it is like follows this definition I just on the previous, had on the previous slide, can always be written as some kind of expansion or a, in terms of either a sum or an integral over either finitely or infinite, infinitely many such feature functions. And in fact, also every function that can be written like this is positive definite. That part is actually relatively easy to see. The proof is even on this slide. The other, the other way around is not easy to see at all and it requires functional analysis. Um, so, okay, yeah, so this particular construction kind of worked, but of course, 
it just gave us one kernel. So today we have to think about how many other kernels it can give us. But before we do that, let me first quickly recap a little bit more. So we um, gave a name to this object that arises. We said, if we do things this way, so if we encapsulate the computation of the covariance inside of a function so that our Gaussian object actually only calls that function once it's needed, we call this object a Gaussian process. So process is a word from statistics that always implies that of, um, constructions over potentially, potentially infinitely large collections of random variables which are described by the properties of any finite restriction of these infinite collections. So this is exactly what we have here also by definition. At such a Gaussian process is a computer program, basically a probability distribution, over a function with values such that every finite restriction to function values has valid Gaussian form. Yes? They are also stochastic processes, yes. They are not point processes. There are other types of stochastic processes, but they are stochastic processes. A stochastic process is really just a collection of random variables such that any finite restriction of those random variables has some property. And in this case, the property is that it's Gaussian distributed. That's why it's called a Gaussian process. We will see other stochastic processes later on, for example, Markov processes. By the way, someone already used the word Markov process on some, I don't know, in the feedback or in the forum. This is not a Markov process in this construction. There will be Markov processes later. It's another thing. It's completely separate. So the one thing I didn't do on Thursday, because I didn't have time for it, is to talk about what do, now this is just a prior, right? It's just defining a distribution over function values. What we would like to do is to do machine learning. We'd like to give it some data, and then it should return a posterior distribution over function values. So how do we do that? Well, one straightforward way to do this is to just go back to the parametric setting, to this, the setting with a bunch of features, and think again about what we actually did in that setting. So here is the slide that I copied over again from a previous, uh, previous lecture. Um, uh, we, just to remind you, if we assume that the function has this parametric form with Gaussian priors over the weights and Gaussian likelihood, then the posterior over the weights is a Gaussian with a bunch of linear algebra objects. And the associated posterior over the function values, we can get through this kind of detour through the weight space. So we can first think about weights, a bunch of finitely many weights, so vectors of weights of our finitely wide shallow neural network with quadratic output loss, and then compute the posterior in the weight space and project back into the function space by, again, using the fact that Gaussians are closed under affine maps. So when we do that, we get a Gaussian posterior over the function values which looks like this. And I'll clean this up a little bit. So I'll take this equation and move it up to the top. And now we can see again that the posterior over the function values has a bunch of, has a mean and a covariance, which are again basically functions of inputs. And now I've highlighted again with the bullet and the circle where those inputs go. And we can notice again that. The, the main observation here is that there is never a lonely phi in these expressions. You'll never find an just a feature vector phi that isn't multiplied from the left or the right with something else. So we don't actually need to write down phi as such. We just need the objects that it gets multiplied with. In particular, we have one instance where phi is multiplied from the right over here and over there with a mean vector. We already know that we call this the mean function and that it's a bit boring. And that the interesting object are these here and here and also here, which are inner products, again, between the features, a matrix, and the other features. So again, it's a big array multiplied with an array multiplied with an array. And that's just an instance of evaluating our kernel at other kind of pairs of inputs. So if we have the kernel available, we can fill out these individual objects and write them like this. So our posterior over the function value, now I'm going to call it a Gaussian process because now it's really a function that we can call, um, has a mean 
function. Why? Because it has these inputs dot that makes it a function. And what does that function do? Well, it evaluates the prior mean. And then it takes the data, subtracts the predictive mean. So here's our story again of what did we observe? What did we expect it to be? We expected it to be mx, so the mean evaluated at the input locations, at the training set. Construct the difference between the two. That's a kind of a surprise. How far are they? A residual. And then divide, actually, it's a residual. It's just the difference between what we thought it would be and what we got to see it, it, it to be. And then we sort of divide by, or we multiply from the ref, left with the inverse of this covariance matrix, which gives us a measure of surprise. So the covariance matrix tells us how far we expected things to be apart from the mean. So if we standardize by it, we get some kind of standardized distance, right? How far is it? from what we thought it to be on the scale of what we thought it to be. Um, and then this object, which is a vector, right, because it's a vector multiplied by a matrix, so another vector, we call it alpha, sometimes called representer weights. Then we multiply it from the left with a kernel, which, takes a, which computes the covariance between the observations at the training inputs and any arbitrary input we would like, bullet. And the posterior covariance is the prior covariance, or the kernel, which is, which is a function, minus an object that, again, looks a lot like what we've already seen here. So we take this matrix from the mean um, and its inverse, or by the, maybe we have a Cholesky decomposition of it, or some other matrix decomposition, uh, matrix square root, and multiply that from the left and right with our kernel function. And notice that, so there are two things to notice here. Uh, which, by the way, so we can re rewrite this a little bit more compactly like this. This is already kind of computational view. Um, the two important things to notice is that we can do all of this in the kind of, in the, in the data space, if you like. So the computations we need to do is we take the data, we construct this vector alpha, that's a finite vector, and we construct this matrix, the gram matrix and its inverse, so the Cholesky decomposition, this LL transpose, and that's a finite computation, polynomial time computation. And then we multiply from the left and right with these function-valued objects, k, with a bullet or a circle inside. And that's the lazy evaluation part. So we can do the training of this shallow neural network in finite time. And then afterwards, only afterwards, start to think about where it should predict. That's a very useful property to have. Right? There's some kind of lazy evaluation happening here. The other thing to notice is that this is just, by construction, another Gaussian process. Why? Because it's a Gaussian distribution over function values, which has a mean function and a covariance function that we can instantiate. This actually shouldn't be surprising, because we know mathematically that Gaussians are you know, exponential families, and we have a likelihood that it's also Gaussian, and da 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 da, da. So the posterior, this is just a conjugate prior con uh, posterior story again, over and over again. But now we see it sort of in a very, very concrete form. Yes? So the, just to make sure I understand, the question is, where do we get this, the, the, the circle, the white or black dots from? OK. So, Maybe in an, in, a, in an abstract sense, this is the kind of confusion about functional programming, right? Where do we get the input for the function from? Well, in a sense, we don't actually think about it yet. We're just constructing a function, and then the inputs will come later. But if you are confused by this white dot being white, maybe it's easier for you to just think of a black dot every time I write a, I write a white dot. And then you're just thinking in broadcasted matrices, which is maybe actually the stronger view. So if, you're, if in your head you're already doing broadcasting, then that's good. If in your head you want to think of a function that takes two inputs, where each input is of type x, then white dot and black dot make more sense. So how do we actually implement something like this? Well, it's just another Gaussian process, right? So the prior we constructed had this, had this form that I showed you last week, that it's a Gaussian process. Here, this thing, I'll zoom in a bit more. Can you read it like this in the back as well? 
Yeah? So priors are this, this new class called Gaussian process, which are parameterized by two functions, mean and covariance. And they have this thing called call me, right? Evaluate the thing, which does the lazy evaluation, which instantiates the actual evaluation. It triggers evaluating the functions. So at the after conditioning, so when we condition, we hand this thing a data set, x and y, and a likelihood. So we need to say what the sigma is, right? The noise on the evaluation. And then it's supposed to return an object that is itself a Gaussian process. And so that means we're going to use inheritance for this, right? The thing we are constructing is a posterior Gaussian process, and posterior Gaussian processes are also Gaussian processes. So they will reuse a lot of the stuff that is already implemented in Gaussian processes. And re remember that Gaussian processes use Gaussians as the internal object. So we inherit all these tricks about sampling and you know, decompositions of covariance matrices and so on and so on directly from our Gaussian-based class. So how does this conditional Gaussian process look like? It's implemented down here. Here is the constructor for this thing. This inherits the property that it's a Gaussian process. Here is proper object-oriented programming. That's why you learned all of this in your second semester. Um, we instantiate this class by saying the prior, this thing has a thing called a prior, and the prior gives us the mean function and the covariance function, m and k. And so we just take that over. Now we already have mean and covariance function because they are stored in the prior. And then it gets, gets a data set, y and x, for which we just make sure that they have the right shape. That's just sort of asserting, making things the right, the right way. We store the noise of, the, of the, um, the likelihood. And now we must also make sure we initialize all the superclasses. So that's in particular the Gaussian process and also the Gaussian type class. And now we implement the Basically, the two, uh, where is it? The two important things here, the posterior mean and the posterior covariance. And that's the, those are the only bits of code that we'll look at today. The rest is just plumbing, basically. So a posterior Gaussian process is a Gaussian process that has a different type of mean function for which we start with the prior mean, which is this function valued object, non-parametric object, self prior x mu. And notice that when we call prior x, then that instantiates evaluating this function. So the moment you, someone hands you x, this thing inside will call the prior at x. The prior at x will call the Gaussian base class and construct the Gaussian distribution with mean vectors and covariances. And suddenly, we have finite objects. And everything is tractable. And then it constructs this covariance matrix, k a covariance between the black circle. Here is our black circle. It's this x and the training data. And the training data is stored inside of this trained deep neural net, uh, shallow neural network. And this indexing here just makes sure that this thing knows that it should broadcast. Right? We will construct a matrix of size, number of input points, cross number of training data points. And then we multiply with this thing called the representer weights, which is this linear algebra object called alpha, which is on the previous slide. And they got constructed up there. You can actually see what happens, right? We, we construct first the Cholesky decomposition of the covariance, and then we, mul we solve for um, x uh, prior data minus prior mean minus whatever if the likelihood had a shift, and we add that as well. It's just for generality. And what's the posterior covariance? Similar thing. It's the prior covariance, which is now instantiated. The moment we hand it an A and B, it becomes a function. Um, minus covariance between the input points. So A is the black circle. And the training data. So now we have an array of size, whatever A is, cross number of training points. And then Cholesky solve internal computation with a, with a matrix times prior kernel at training data and white circle. The white circle is called B here. So B is white circle, A is black circle. And that's it. 
Now we've defined our Gaussian process. And what we can now do is something like this. We can load a bunch of data points and define the objects we need for our Gaussian process. I've already done this last Thursday, so I've simplified things now a bit. We need a prior mean, which could be zero. But for generality, I'm assuming it's a constant mean, which if I div don't give it a constant, it's just zero. So it's just a, a function that is just straight line at height c, where if I don't give a c, it's just at zero. And then I need this kernel, which is this, by construction from last Thursday, a function that takes two inputs, x and y, black circle, white circle. And it evaluates the square distance between x and y scaled by the length scale l, sums out the batch dimension, my, the last one, divides by 2, minus in front, puts an exponential around it. So that's just a Gaussian function. It's just exp of minus square distance divided by 2, scaled by l. Those are the two objects we need. I have already run this. No, I haven't. OK, now it's run. And now we construct, this is the actual piece of inference. So we say this, the kernel I actually want to use, I'm just going to wrap this somewhere, is this kernel where we set the length scale to 1. So this is currying. It's functional programming. We just get rid of the length scale so that we can hand it to the Gaussian process. Yes? Yeah, I could also use it. So you could also write this kernel as lambda of AB um, as E kernel of AB, comma L. L equal to 1.2. And then I instantiate a prior. Say this is a Gaussian process which uses a constant mean in this kernel. And then I say, please condition on this data set, which is observations y at locations x with noise sigma. Bam, done. Actually, not much has happened yet. Nothing, in fact. We've just constructed an abstract object which hasn't done any computations yet. That's why it is so fast. We just set up all the structures. There's been no training yet. Why? Because I haven't asked you to do anything. So I'm also going to define a plot function, which is just you know, nasty matplotlib. So you can, you, know, you can look at this later, but it it's has nothing to do with the math we're doing here. It's just a little bit of you know, fiddling around to make a nice plot. And then I can say, please plot the prior and the posterior, and here it is. So the moment I call this function, it actually does something. It tells our objects, oh, I want you to know, I want to know the, a prediction at all these points, and then it instantiates all these objects, it constructs a Cholesky decomposition of the training data, stores it somewhere, and then blah, 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 gives us this prediction. So in the back, in black, you see the prior distribution which comes from this Gaussian process. And in red, you see the posterior that arises from this data set. Yes? So wonderful question. How do we change this shape? So I've sort of, from up until now, it seems like this Gaussian kernel is just what we need to use. Because that's the only thing we've been able to do so far, right? We had this one construction with these Gaussian features, with the little bell-shaped features, and then we took the limit of ever, ever more of these Gaussian features. And that's it, right? So it has to be this kernel. Maybe the one thing we could actually change is we could set the length scale to like something else. Let's say 2, right? So we, that's a slower, broader Gaussian features. And then this looks like this. It does more smoothing, a mm, bit boring. Or maybe we could set the length scale to 0.5. And then this looks like this. So now it's a little bit more sensitive, kind of it changes more rapidly. But somehow this is, this is underwhelming. Right? You've learned about deep learning and all these features and reloose and complicated setups. This seems like it's encapsulating a little bit too much. Now we're just stuck with this one kernel. Are there any other kernels? Right? Is there anything else we could do? And yes, we can. So what we're going to do now is just a few more of these constructions for a few minutes. So here's another one, which is pretty much exactly the same construction we did last Thursday, but with a different collection of feature functions. <laughs> 
Let me maybe motivate this a bit. Whoops, sorry, wrong side. So um, in lecture six, I had all, you will remember that I had this sort of various constructions for um, Gaussian priors over function values. And one of them that we used was this with the, with what, which what I called switch features. So what you see here is, I need to zoom out a little bit, right? So um, here in green, you see in 17 little step functions that start, as you can see in the code up there, from minus eight to plus eight, there's a lin space over uh, 17 of these little steps that just are zero all the way to wherever that lin space grid is, and then they become one. So they are zero all the way from the left, and then they become one. Um, so the math way of writing down these features is like this. The feature i at x is what's called the heavy side step function. Heavy side with an i, not with a y. Um, which has the property that it's one whenever the input is larger than zero and zero everywhere else. That's the step functions, right? They are just zero, and then at the point they become one. Non-differentiably, just a big step. And we're going to use the same prior covariance uh, for the features that I've used before, actually with a like uh, chronic or delta here, ij. So the covariance between the features is just diagonal to make things easy. That makes, means that our inner product between that which we need inside of the kernel can be written as this single sum. And here I've already simplified something. So here's the important thing to think about. If you have two features which are zero if xi is less than CL, and another feature which is zero if xj is less than CL, then in this inner product, we have, a, we have a product between two functions that are either zero or one, right? So these features look like they go like this, and they come up, and then they go up here, where this is CL. And this is the x space. So if I multiply two of these, so if I multiply theta of xi minus CL, with theta of xj minus cl, then what is this function? It's either 0 or 1, right? Because both of these things are either 0 or 1. So when is it 0? It's 0 if one of them is 0. And it's one if both of them are one. This is an AND function. That's what it is. It becomes one if both are one, and it's zero all the other times. So that means in this, in this term in the sum, we get basically a single step function that becomes one if both of these inputs are larger than CL, so that in particular means that the minimum of the two inputs is larger than CL, right? So that's the tricky part of this derivation. If you get this bit, then the rest will be, well, easier. All right, so if I multiply two of these, maybe a way to think about this is you could be a second feature that comes in from the left and it's Location is sort of, well, actually, no. Well, that's, that's confusing. I shouldn't write it like this, because then this is in feature space rather than in x space. So maybe it's just easier to think about this and say, if you think of this as a function of xi and xj, for this to be large, for this to be one, both, of, both terms have to be one. So the minimum between these two have, has to be larger than CL. OK. Now we do the same hand wavy thing again that I did last week, where I say, Oh, let's just assume that we have more and more and more of these features. And they are on a regular grid. A regular grid is called a lin space in NumPy from C max to Z0. I'm not calling it Z0 because it's going to have an interesting property in a moment. And I increase the number of features. So in this construction with the code, I basically, I raise this slider. So I put more and more and more and more and more and more of these. 
And you can see that there are more and more and more and more of these features, and they are on a regular grid, right? But because we are scaling by the number of features, actually the gray thing in the background doesn't become broader. It just, there's just more and more and more of these features. The resolution increases, if you like. And that's it, I mean, nothing else. Then asymptotically, this thing becomes an integral in the Riemann sense, where individual little boxes, where in each delta C box, infinitesimal step, the value of C is constant, right, because it's infinitesimally wide. And we are summing over the values that are in the sum, and the sum becomes an integral. That's the other bit where you have to sort of squint your eyes a little bit. And then after that, it's mechanical, right? After this, you're done. The rest is just stuff you did in first, your first undergraduate year in math. So now it's an integral. Um, an integral over the step function. So we integrate something from C0 to C max, which is either 0 or 1. So when does it become 1 and 0? Here's a little bit, I think you have to sort of bend your mind a, a little bit around it, but it's really not complicated. The C is negative here, right? So as C increases, for a while, we keep seeing 1s, because the minimum of xi and xj is larger than C. And then at some point, c becomes larger than the minimum of xi and xj, and then this thing becomes 0. So that means our integral will go from z0 until minimum of xi and xj. And then after that, there is nothing more to integrate. And it's just a one function doing that thing. So integrating the one function is easy. It's just c, right? And we just evaluate c at minimum and c0, and that's it. This is our kernel. What does this thing actually look like in code? So I've implemented this here. Uh, here. This is the kernel we're going to use. I'm going to tell you in a moment why it's called Wiener. Um, it has two inputs, xi and xj, and it just computes the, um, <laughs> it computes the minimum of xi and xj, subtracts a shift, which I call C0 on the slides. And um, then it does a maximum around the product just for like, continuity's sake, for, so that this works in multidimensional inputs as well. If we do this, if we use this kernel, now I've used the lambda notation instead of func tools partial, and do the same thing again. We construct a Gaussian prior, condition on the data, call the posterior, we get this output. So the prior in the background looks like this thing that increases in width. And it has these really wiggly functions inside. And the posterior looks like this. And it extrapolates constant on the right. Interesting. Maybe this is a property you might want sometimes. It extrapolates in some sense much better than the one we had before, because it doesn't go back down to 0. It just stays at wherever it went to. And it has this starting point, which I call minus 8, because that puts it to the left end of the plot. But we could also set it to you know, minus 5. And then we get this plot. Ooh. So there's nothing over here. We could set it to 0. And then there's nothing before 0. Why? Because the covariance is just 0. And if the covariance is 0, the function value has to be 0. There's nothing else to do. And this works because we are using, inside of the Gaussian base class, the sample function, which uses the SVD, which doesn't complain about this. It just says, OK, there's nothing to sample from, so I'm just going to sample zeros. Done. Why is this an interesting process to think about? So here it is again. Here's a plot for it. So this is actually the oldest Gaussian process, arguably. And it comes long before these Gaussian little features, these little bell-shaped features. Why? Because one way to think about what happens here is that we have these individual little step functions that get switched on. Right? So we start from the left end of the plot. And at some point, the point is called C0, the very first of these step functions switches on. And then what happens is that step function is associated with a Gaussian weight. So it's like a stochastic random Gaussian perturbation, up or down. 
So our function will now take a step up or down by a value that is given by the scale of this feature times a Gaussian random variable. And then we take a step forward by c max minus c min times number of weights. And another step feature switches on. And it gives another Gaussian random perturbation up or down. And then another one, and another one, and another one. And with every time step, with every step on the x-axis, our function gets a little kick up or down by a Gaussian random number. And in the limit of infinitesimal such steps, we get the interesting behavior that the functions that come out of this, they are very irregular. Because at every infinitesimal step, there is an infinitesimal perturbation up or down. And overall, we can see, if you look at the math, that the kernel, which is the covariance, is a linear function. If you think of this, if you set xi equal to xj, that's the diagonal of the covariance matrix. So that's what we plot in these plots. Actually, the square root of it is what we plot, the standard deviation. Then this grows linearly with x. Right? There's just x here, just x minus constant. So the standard deviation is the square root of that. So that means the standard deviation, as you can see, grows like a square root. And the intuition for this is, think of a particle that is moving through time. And at every time step, it interacts with the other particles in the room that give it a kick in a random direction. So if this is in one dimension, then the kick can only be up or down. So y is only one dimension. But it could be two or three dimensions as well. So in this room, there's a bunch of particles as well. And they all move around. And at basically, sort of approximately every infinitesimal time step, they interact with another particle that bumps into them and gives them a random perturbation in one direction. And this is exactly what this guy used to construct a theory for the thermodynamics of free gases. Albert Einstein wrote a, a paper in 1905. 1905, as you may know, is this Anus Mirabilis, where he wrote three papers that were all Nobel Prize worthy. This is one of them. It's not the one he got a Nobel Prize for. But huh? he said the problem of so-called Brownian motion, so the motion of free particles in a gas, can be described by thinking of infinitesimal steps where the particle always gets a random Gaussian perturbation. And he does this construction that is pretty much exactly what we just did and then finds that the um, statistics of this path as a function of time t, so t is our x-axis, and his x-axis is our y-axis, grows with the square root of time. And that explains Brownian motion. You see particles move around in a stochastic random walk-type fashion, and as time moves on, you see the particles move away from the origin, but with a square root of time in distance. So Brownian motion, or sometimes called the Wiener process for statisticians, is the very first Gaussian process. And it was inv invented in 1905 by Albert Einstein. Let's put it like that. It's a bit complicated because many people have thought about this process before. And of course, he also cites people in this paper. But pretty much, that's the paper that you should think of. 1905, to theory, the Wärme geforderte Bewegung von in ruhenden Flüssigkeiten suspendierten Teilchen. So about, um, I'll do that as well, and then we take a break. Um, 1905, around 85 years later, we get a wonderful contribution by this woman. She's called Grace Waba. She actually already did this work much earlier in her PhD with her PhD advisor Kimmeldorf. Um, where she sort of develops a statistical tool set out of these physical processes called Gaussian processes. And she wrote a book, which came out of her PhD thesis, I think, called Spline Models for Observational Data, in which she introduces another kernel. Actually, she introduces a whole lot of them in a much more theoretical fashion than we do here. But which we can think of as another third possible construction of a kernel. Now, we've had two so far, this spare exponential kernel, very smooth, and this Wiener kernel, which is actually very, very rough. Right? 
she has introduced a third thing, which we can think of from our perspective in 2013 as introducing ReLU features. Now she says, if you think of this step feature that we just looked at here, you could integrate it from the left, right? And if you integrate a step function, you get a step linear function that starts at 0. You integrate 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 up until the point you get to the step, and then you get a linear function, right? We can do this in our code here as well. I call this ReLU, of course. Actually, I use these by like, sort of symmetric ReLU. Let's make it simpler and use a one-sided ReLU that starts at one point. And then at every individual, like, lin space step, there is such a linear function coming out. This is a regular shallow neural network with ReLU features, if you like. If you like the physics interpretation, you can think of a particle with momentum in a gas. So every time, every infinitesimal time step, our particle gets a kick from another particle. But because it has mass, if you leave it, it will just keep its drifting in this direction. That's why each individual kick gives a linear term. And now we get more and more of these kicks that each move the momentum of the particle around, but they move the momentum and not the velocity, uh, not, the, not the position of the particle, actually. If we do this construction, then, well, OK, so one observation is that this is like integrating the function, but we could keep our like, work simple and do the derivation just like we did on the previous slides. So we say, we now have a feature set again, and now the features are these ReLU features. They are not step functions anymore. They are ReLUs, so they are constant, and then they become linear. And then we do the same thing over and over again. So our covariance function called kernel will be of this type. That's what we're trying to compute. Again, we're going to assume that we scale by the width of the space and divide by the number of features. If we do this, then we take an inner product over maxima. And now you have to, again, think about, well, for what, what does this have to be so that the function is non-zero? Well, both inputs have to be larger than CL. So um, and after that, the function will become linear. So a way to do this is to write it with a max and a min, and then um, multiply by the features, which then become linear at that point where xi and xj are larger than cl. And again, take this limit of infinitesimal steps. Then the sum becomes an integral. We just replace cl with c and integrate over c. And we notice that we have to do the integral from c0 up to the minimum, just like on the previous slide. Everything is exactly the same. We're just integrating a different function now. It's not a constant function. It's a linear function. Actually, it's two linear functions. And if you integrate over the product of two linear functions, so uh, the product of two linear functions is a, it's a quadratic function. If you integrate over a quadratic function, you get out a quartic function, something to raise to the power of 3. If you do that, you get this kernel, which looks you know, complicated, but it's something we can implement in a piece of code. And I've done it for you. Um, actually, not here, but in uh, here's another example, which I call integrated Wiener, because that's what it is. It's the integrated Wiener process. And it just does this. So here is this complicated expression that you just saw on the slide. Um, let's call it integrated Wiener. Wiener, by the way, after Norbert Wiener, right? And huh, it does this interesting thing that it produces this sort of very smooth function that goes roughly sort of interpolates between the data. And it extrapolates linearly upwards, not constant, but linearly. Why is that? That's the last thing we'll do before the break. If you look at this expression, you see that it's a cubic function in the x. Right, this is clearly a polynomial in x. And there is a 2 here and then another x. And then there is just a 3 here. So the whole thing is a cubic object in x. Yes? Well, it's just, that's just what the integral gives you. It just looks like this. 
Ah, oh, this one. OK, yeah, that's actually a bug. Yeah, like this. OK, yeah. Sorry, good point. So it's just minimum cubed of this plus 1 half absolute distance minimum squared of this. So if you think back to what the posterior covariance actually is, where is it? Here. Um, then you can think of the posterior mean is the prior mean plus a bunch of numbers that we compute with linear algebra multiplied by the kernel. So that means the posterior mean function is actually a sum over kernels. Right? This, this thing here, that's a sum. It's a sum over the xi, alpha xi, times kernel. Now, if each of these kernels is a cubic function, then the posterior is a sum over cubic functions. And what it's trying to do is to interpolate between the data. So if you interpolate between, if you interpolate between data points with cubic polynomials, and you have n data points and n such cubic terms available, what is the interpolant? The sum over n cubic polynomials. It's a cubic spline. It's the cubic functions that interpolate between the data. And that's why this is called a spline kernel. So splines used to be these things that technical drawers used to make straight lines, you know, Bezier curves and so on. So it used to be these little metal bendy rulers that they would put onto the, the drawing board, right, and bend them so that they would minimize, right, you just, if you take a metal me, piece of metal ruler and bend it a bit, it takes a minimum energy curve called a spline, and then you, you can use it to draw a nice smooth line on a piece of paper. That's what these are. Everything's connected. So now we can take a break. We're a little bit late for a break, but let's do it anyway. I'll continue at 11.18. What we have now seen is there isn't just one kernel. There isn't just the, the square exponential kernel. There is also the Wiener kernel, and there's also this cubic spline kernel. And in a way, this is maybe a relief because it seemed very restrictive, this Gaussian process framework, right? But it's also a worry that you know from deep learning as well. Now suddenly we have to choose. It would have been nice to say there is this one universal framework for learning functions, and it's called the square exponential kernel. And I'm, this is not a joke, actually. For a significant time duration of the machine learning community, people actually thought this in some sense that we will talk about after the Lent break, actually. And now we've discovered that oh, there's just, just this one thing. There's the other kernel. There's the Wiener kernel. There's the integrated Wiener kernel. Are there more kernels? We should think at some point about whether one of them is better than the other. But first, you need to understand how many there actually are. Well, it turns out there are many more kernels. Here is a very important type of kernel, um, which we can't, at least I don't know how to easily construct it from a feature construction in a general sense. Well, I sort of have an idea for how, but it's not going to be nice. Um, and it's maybe an example of how sometimes mathematical insight is actually very exciting, or no, sorry, very useful. Um, so this is the so-called Matern family of kernels. It's named after, uh, I think, Swedish or Norwegian forestry expert who uh, uh, constructed them for the first time. It looks complicated, and it is. Um, so this is a function of two inputs. And it has two parameters called nu and l, where nu has to be positive and l also has to be positive. You can think of l as a length scale and nu as a parameter. And what it does is it takes, there's a gamma function in here, which we already know. OK, good. And then there is this rational function here with this nu. And then there is this, this thing called k nu, which is the modified Bessel function of the second kind. And whenever something like this shows up, you're like, OK, I'm going to have to call a library. Um, uh, that's, that there's some, some fancy Wikipedia entry for this that tells you that this thing is the solution of some differential equation and God knows what. Actually, for new equal to um, essentially an integer number, so for integer values of new, 
this Bessel function has a particular explicit form that involves essentially factorial, so there are gamma functions showing up again. It's just a bit of an un inconvenient parameterization that Matern chose, so we actually have to set nu to an integer plus one half, otherwise the things don't line up right. But if you do it this way, then the first three of these kernels look like this. The first one is this kernel, so it's just the exponential of the minus absolute distance. Not squared, just absolute distance. So these individual, so this kernel function looks a little bit like an Eiffel Tower. It looks like, like this. Well, I mean, maybe the Eiffel Tower looks like this. And if the Eiffel Tower would continue below the surface, then <laughs> like this. There's an XKCD where the Randall Munro actually claims that the Eiffel Tower in log space looks like a triangle. So that would be true if this is the case. Um, so this process actually also has an interpretation. It's the corresponding thing in physics to a Wiener process if the particle that moves around in free gas isn't actually free, but it sits in a potential well that has parabolic shape. There's the physicist nodding in the middle. Huh? So if you have a free gas that sits in a harmonic potential, then it gets sort of whenever the particle moves away from zero, it gets pushed back towards zero. And that's what this thing does. And it produces, actually, we can look at our code. Um, I have a thing here called matern1. And it has a parameter called L that I need to set. That's the length scale. So I need to make sure that I set this to L. And the length scale should be probably something like 1. Then if you see this in red. So we again get functions that are very strongly rough. They, they are non-differentiable almost everywhere, to make a mathematical statement. Um, and you can see almost the shape of this kernel inside. I can make it a bit more obvious by scaling it up. I'll multiply it by like basically 10 in the standard deviation. And you can sort of see this thing sort of going all the way to the data points and then retracting back towards zero. You can also make this very, very strict by sort of making our potential well acting act fast, and then the function will quickly return to zero pretty much. Whoops. Oh, that was the wrong length scale. Like this, like, whoo, 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 becomes right, right back. Um, OK, and there are other versions of this, 3 half, 5 half, and so on. And the interesting thing about this is that for each integer value of nu, or p actually here, the, the samples that come from this stochastic process become differentiable by one more order. So the einstein uhlenbeck process is non-differentiable almost everywhere. For 3 half, we get functions that are differentiable almost everywhere, but not twice differentiable almost everywhere. For 5 half, we get twice differentiable functions, but not three times differentiable functions, and so on. And this is why this is a very interesting class of kernels, because it can be used for analytical purposes to construct sample spaces, hypothesis classes, that have a very defined regularity, and have a certain number of derivatives available. And actually, there's a limit case if you take the um, p to infinity, it turns out that through some beautiful math, you can show that the resulting limit kernel is this square exponential kernel again. So if we take this order here, you see it on the, in black, einstein uhlenbeck so p equals nu equal to 1 half, p equal to 0, and then once differentiable, twice differentiable, and infinitely often differentiable below. An entire family of kernels. There's another type of construction that I just want to show to drive home the point that there are really a lot of kernels, which is called the rational quadratic kernel. And it's actually a construction we could do because we've done exponential families. So the square exponential kernel has this Gaussian shape. And we already know that there is a conjugate prior for the Gaussian called the gamma distribution, which allows us to integrate out an uncertainty over the length scale of this kernel, essentially. So if you assume that you have a square exponential kernel with a length scale where the length scale is actually Gauss, uh, gamma distributed and then integrated out, you get something like an infinite sum over Gaussian-shaped kernels, square exponential kernels, which have um, all sorts of different length scales. 
And how many of each length scale gets contributed to this integral depends on the parameter alpha and beta of this construction. If you set beta to 1 and integrate out, then alpha shows up, obviously, in the integral. And you get this expression at the top here, which is this thing. And you can think of this as a scale mixture of these smooth functions. So they are infinitely often differentiable almost everywhere, but their length scale kind of moves up and down. You see in the samples that sometimes they become quite smooth, and then suddenly they have a big bend up and down, and then they become smooth again. So I'm not saying you have to use this kernel everywhere, or that it's somehow better than the square exponential kernel or whatever. My point is actually that there are many such kernels. There is this square exponential kernel that we saw last Thursday. There's now the Wiener kernel that we started if, uh, a half an hour ago. There's this cubic spline kernel. There are this, this, this Matern family that includes models for particles with mass and momentum and so on. And then there is even another one. So for example, Chris Williams in 1998 published a kernel. There was a phase in the machine learning community when people were excitedly constructing kernels that had lots of lots of cool properties. For example, if you assume that you build a neural network, which in 1998 meant that there were sinusoidal link functions, tan h functions flying around, and you assume that those tan h functions have some distribution around 0, because that's how you initialize your neural network with Gaussian locations around 0, then you can integrate out, actually, this object, because that's an integral that Chris Williams found in a book. And it gives you a covariance matrix, that, a covariance function that looks like this. So the arcos sine, the arc sine of inner products with square roots. You can implement that kernel yourself if you like. And back then, people were excited about it because it meant, ooh, we can have infinitely wide neural networks. Maybe we never need to train neural networks again. We can just do linear algebra. And it felt very powerful because linear algebra is really powerful. Right? It felt like we never have to do gradient descent again. We don't have to simulate the brain. That's, that's stupid stuff that like Jan de Kuhn and Jeff Hinton does. Right? We can do kernels with infinitely many features. And everything is just linear algebra. No SGD, no Adam, directly. So you, I mean, it's 2023, so you know that somehow that didn't quite work out. But we'll need to think about why. And we'll do that after the land break. So maybe just to close this thought here, we now have already a collection of parameterized kernels. Which one should we choose? Well, before we can even decide which one to choose, if you're a mathematician, maybe you have more of an urge to think, what is the structure of this space? Can I use those kernels somehow as starting points to index a space of kernels and build more? And for that, we can go back and think about what we actually need from a kernel. So the one thing we needed kernels to be was what? Someone can shout it out. Positive semi-definite. So they have to be functions that, when evaluate on a collection of points, give a positive definite, semi-definite matrix every time. So positive definite matrices. <clears throat> so I've learned that when I go over here, the camera can't see me anymore. And that means that when you watch the videos over the land break, you're going to say, ah, I couldn't see you there. And then I don't need to take a picture or whatever. So I'll, I'll just wipe out the blackboard for a moment. So while I wipe out the blackboard, you can think for yourself what a positive definite matrix was again, if you forgot already. So it's a matrix which has the property that if we take any arbitrary vector and multiply it from the left and the right to our matrix, this will be non-negative for every possible choice of vector in whatever the size of our matrix is. Right? So what could I do with this matrix easily Oh, yeah, n. You're right. The matrix is n by n. So um, what could I do to k to make sh to, without changing this property? If I had found one kernel which has this property, what can I do to it? Good, 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 good. Lots, 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 lots of ideas. OK, let's slowly. Let's go again. Who said someone said something with a constant? Multiply. multiply by a constant. Yes, OK. Good thing. So we could multiply by a constant alpha from the outside. 
That's like multiplying by alpha on the inside, and nothing changes, as long as alpha is larger than 0. Interesting. What else? Linear combinations. We could have alpha times k plus beta times k prime. Because then, if you do v from left and right, because it's linear algebra, everything is just, you know. OK, good. What else? Yeah. Those are the easy ones, right? Yeah? Say again? Decompose k. In which sense? Ah, something like a Cholesky. I think this is getting a little bit outside. But you have this, maybe there's something pointing in the right direction, which is actually sort of obvious once I've shown you the theorem. So we had this theorem by Mercer that says that we can write any such kernel. We can sort of, in, 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 like, in quotation marks, we can write it as a sum over i phi i of x so the function at x and y, phi i of x times phi i of y. So what we can do is, if we have any function of x of the input, we could, we could sort of, if it has an inverse, we can think of this as phi i of some transformation. What should I call the transformation? Let's call it gamma inverse of x, right? And then we're in another space, sort of. And if I apply the same gamma to both inputs, then that's still a kernel, because it's still of this form. It's still a function applied to the inputs, and then taking the inner product of these functions. This is actually a result of Mercer's theorem directly. So it's not so straightforward. You need the theorem for it. And then there is something else, actually, which is the fact that if you take two symmetric positive definite matrices and you multiply them with each other pointwise, so Hadamard product, not matrix vectrix product, but Hadamard product, so element wise product, star in Python, in NumPy, star not at, then they remain positive definite. And that's completely not obvious. So you can't just look at it and say, ah, that's true. Right? Um, so to sh this, is, this is called the sure product theorem. And if you want to read a proof, there is actually two papers that you can look up. And they are not short. So it's complicated. So what this means is we can take a kernel, and we can multiply it by a constant that's larger than 0. We can scale the input arbitrarily as long as we scale both inputs with the same function. We can add linearly combined kernels, and we can multiply them as functions. So that's what a Hadamard product is. We multiply the functions that make the elements of the matrix. And they always remain positive definite. What, one way to talk about this is that the set of kernels forms a semi-ring because of these linear combinations. So what does this actually mean for our modeling language? Right? It's sort of mathematical property. What does this actually mean? Well, so let's first think about the scaling thing. So we can scale by a constant. If you scale by a constant, you've actually already seen me do this just now in the last example. That means scaling the output distribution of this Gaussian process. So on the left, you see in green the prior and in red the posterior from a particular Matern class kernel. So this is, this is the one that makes once differentiable functions, um, where we multiply by 1 implicitly on the outside. And I've actually done this just now in code. I've multiplied by 10 to make it broader. And that's literally what happens. It just makes the output space broader. And this actually has a non-trivial effect. Why? Because there is noise on these observations. So they have little arrow bars. And that means there's sort of a trade-off between how broad the prior is and how noisy the observations are. And so you see that the line here, at, in particular at the end, actually gets now moved right to the data points. The model becomes a bit more flexible, if you like. This wouldn't happen if sigma were 0, but sigma 0 is also a bit of a pathological case, because then you would always interpolate between the data. 
The other thing we could do is this business with the inputs. So we could take the inputs and scale them by an arbitrary function, transform them by an arbitrary function. A simple function to use is a linear function. So if I take the same prior again, now multiplied by 10, and I use a particular transformation of the inputs that is called dividing by L, which is a linear function, then that gives an, a scale to the input space of the, of the Gaussian process reversal. So scaling the, the kernel outside scales the output space, and scaling the inside kind of changes the length scale of this process. For small l, distances are measured on small scales, and so we quickly return to zero. And for large length scales, distances are measured on large scales, and so it takes a long time to return to zero. Yes? Ah, so you're, you're asking sort of the obvious question in the room. It's good because it means you're, like, you're basically ahead of what I'm trying to present. That, that's good. That means it's not too fast, which is there's all these degrees of freedom now. How are we going to set them, right? Can we somehow, can we have a, a method for learning it? It seems annoying that we have to go in and say, oh, now I need to, like, I thought there was just one kernel, but now I realize I have to scale the output and it changes how the method, method works. And now I realize I can change the input, and it changes how the model behaves. How should I set that? OK, we'll get to that. Actually, not today, but we'll get to it on Thursday. And we'll spend most of Thursday talking about it. Yes? So if we, the question is, if we choose a kernel that's not positive definite, what happens with our code? And to be honest, it depends a bit on how it's not positive definite. So if it returns zeros, um, then our code is not going to complain. It will just happily draw zeros and just add zeros everywhere. And we actually had a case of this in, in uh, here, right? So on the left, we have zero variance and nothing happens. It's, not, it's still semi-definite, but not definite. If your kernel returns nans, Hopefully, you'll get error messages. But that, of course, depends on your implementation. So if you go into our Gaussian base class and fiddle around with it, you can make it do other things. And now the interesting question is, what happens if, you, if your kernel returns infs? And you can think about that. I won't, I won't tell you. Um, because returning infs might actually be useful. We might have some dimensions in which our model has infinite degrees of freedom. So, uh, but just to be clear, right, this linear map is just one very specific example with a length scale. It's not the only thing you could do. You could, for example, scale the input by some exponential function relative, relative to some point. And then you get something like this, where at the starting point, the function is basically infinite length scale, or actually not infinite, sorry, length scale one, because exp of zero is one. And then over here, the length scale becomes very, 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 very thin. Or, you know, you figure it out. Try some other transformation that you like. You can use the code that I have put on Ilias for today that I've just shown you a few times today. Arbitrary input transformations. And for those who are already, again, one step ahead, well, what is this here? This might be a neural network that you choose. Hmm? And if you've trained it, there is still a Gaussian process floating around somewhere. Another thing you could do, as we saw, said, is linear combinations of kernels. So here is an example where I've combined two kernels. Actually, in sort of full generality, one of these kernels is what you might call parametric. So it's just a finite sum over a bunch of terms. And the other one is one of these standard kernels. So here I've taken the rational quadratic kernel. And I've also just taken um, this, what, what we call polynomial feature functions in the in lecture six for parametric regression. So it's just the sum over one x, x squared, and x cubed, always with uh, the corresponding scalings in front. 
And you can sort of see this in green in background in the, in the prior. There is this, there's, there's this polynomial shape, right, with a constant plus a linear term plus a quadratic term plus a cubic term. And then on top of that, we get another added function which comes from this rational quadratic kernel. So it's kind of smooth wiggling up and down. And this is a model for functions that globally behave like a polynomial, but locally have some kind of wiggliness to them. And mm, ah, yeah, you can also scale a little bit by, I think there's two different versions of this where I scale with different length scales somewhere. Um, so why would you care about something like this? Well, you may have heard of um, domains like scientific machine learning or interpretable machine learning where you'd like to build a model that you actually understand. So you actually know what it's learning. Not a deep redo neural network with a billion weights where afterwards you don't know anymore what's going on and nobody can tell you what it learned and didn't learn and whether it has learned a certain data point or not and so on. But you'd like to be able to say, you know, I, so I know that the function is twice differentiable. I know that it has a scale of five at the origin and there is a global linear trend in it. But on top of that, there is some small deviation that is differentiable, but it sort of happens on this length scale and it's small compared to the global trend and so on and so on. So on Thursday, that's actually exactly what we'll do. We'll go through an extended example and figure out first how we actually fit all these parameters of the kernel, those that we don't know, how we set those that we do know, and how we combine this, these abilities of kernels, linear output scaling, input scaling, combinations of kernels, and multiplication. Ah, this is actually, by the way, this is what this is. This is the product, the final thing, right? We can multiply kernels with each other, right? That's, uh, that, this is why I was confused. So here it's a sum, there it's a product. What's the difference between a sum and a product? Well, a sum is sort of like an or, right? So two things have high covariance with each other if one of the terms in the sum is large. And a product is like an and. Two function values co-vary strongly with each other if both terms in the product are large compared to zero. All right? Um, blah, blah, blah. That's the end. I'll leave out a bit about how to learn the kernel. We'll do that on Thursday. So what we found out today is that there isn't just one kernel. There is many, many, many different non-parametric models which have infinite degrees of freedom. I'll get to you in a moment. Um, and Actually, there isn't just five of them. There isn't 10 of them. There is entire families of them, and they can be like, com com combined in an algebraic fashion by multiplication with a scalar, transforming the inputs, multiplying matrix the, uh, the functions with each other, like the kernel functions themselves, and linear combinations of them, so adding them together. They span an algebraic structure called a semi-ring that can be used to construct entire complicated model classes. And of course, that raises the question, uh, on the one hand, does this mean these are very powerful models and maybe we don't need deep learning anymore? And on the other hand, how do we choose one of these models? How do we decide for ourselves which one we're going to use if there are so many degrees of freedom? And those are the two things we need to talk about over the next two lectures. But now there's a question. Ah. Are there some kernels that you can't reach from the same? So um, <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Uh, for that, you have to see how you construct the semi-ring, right? You need some kind of generators um, from which you can start at applying these algebraic operations to try and reach kernels. And so your question is really, is there a generating set that is in some sense maximal such that all kernels are reached? And I'll tell you that I don't know. So this is probably one of these questions that has more to do with theoretical computer science or functional analysis. And there's probably some very tricky, complicated answer somewhere about non-enumerability. And if you make it complicated enough, it probably has something to do with the halting problem. So um, what I can say is, and we'll talk about this after the land break, that there are families of kernels that span 
very expressive function classes. In particular, all continuous functions, where continuous can be measured in various different ways. So both Lipschitz and epsilon delta and Holder type um, smoothnesses can be used to construct families of, of kernels that address these entire function spaces. But how they address them, I haven't actually said yet, so we'll do that after the, after the land break. So it's a very powerful class of, of, of models, and if you want to build languages to reach complicated model classes, then it's all about what you start out with before you start combining. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. If there are no more questions, then I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you very much.